So, okay. So welcome everyone to the second session in RT Summit. It will be easier than Sebastian's talk, so, but in the same vein. So the topic of the talk is if you are developing a driver for preempt RT or just submitting a driver open source, how do you know that when RT becomes mainline or even with Sebastian releases, probably your driver will not cause a problem and it will work as smooth as it is intended. So there were some questions about why mainline is not uh, hard real-time compatible and I hinted at that actually at the start so because yeah we are different from plumbers so the audience is more generic. So when people usually talk about preempt RT there is first the the kernel releases, which people call preempt RT, which basically say uh, 6.5 minus RT1 minus RT2 and so on. But then people also, when people say preempt pre RT, that's also the preemption model in uh, the RT releases or when RT becomes mainline. So the Linux kernel has multiple preemption models and preempt RT preemption model is the most uh, the most preemptible, where most of the kernel code paths, as much as we can, can be preempted by higher priority tasks, including user space tasks, and that's the point. So, what's the main benefit of preempt RT? Why do people use it? The main difference between a classical Artus or even an Artus which actually has POSIX compliance, like Integrity OS uh, and others, is that with preempt RT, we give you a guarantee, a guarantee or, and almost, that all of the existing mainline drivers, unless there are bugs, should be working as usual. That's the first part. And the second part is that the standard Linux user space works as usual. So all of the well-known components above the Linux kernel should work with preempt RT. And this is the main benefit over others. For people who might have worked with Artuses outside of Linux, even when they claim full POSIX compliance, usually things do not work out of the box as it is claimed, especially with proprietary uh, Artuses. Uh, and then what preempt RT also provides is that Okay, so you can run your standard Linux applications and databases and whatnot and graphics applications and all of that, but then you can also have your own real-time application with hard real-time priorities. And what the preempt RT kernel does is that it makes most of the kernel code path is preemptible. So actually your application, when it needs to run ASAP, let's say there is a signal from a certain sensor, then the preempt RT kernel can preempt the existing code path, run your application until it relinquishes the CPU due to sleeping or any other mechanism, then goes back. And that's basically preempt RT in a nutshell because there were some questions uh, to Sebastian talk about that part. So what I will do here is provide a short summary of some of the main things that were done driver side in the last three years. Uh, I will cover sequence counters, which is a, lock, uh, a lockless mechanism, and some of the tasklet API changes and some of the trouble we actually that, mm, yeah, it's solved right now, but there are some issues, and some of the custom drivers code and why hopefully we should not have that in the future. So to start with sequence counters, it is basically a lockless mechanism where uh, readers, where you can ensure consistency by readers retrying until the data is valid. So what you typically have is you have uh, a write part on the left, and this is, for example, one, there can be more readers. So uh, here is one reader and uh, basically the reader keeps retrying until 
the counter is uh, even, which implies that actually the data section is valid and then it can read the data. And this is mostly used for data that is uh, read more, much more than it is written. This is, for example, statistics and network drivers. There is a large amount of sequence counter usage uh, and, and similar data. So for preempt RT-wise, now the Linux kernel had sequence counters for a very long time. Uh, but for preempt RT-wise, there was the issue that there, are, there were two issues. And the first one is the right section always needs to be uh, protected within itself, right? There cannot be multiple writers to make sure that the data is consistent. So there is some right serialization mechanism. But, but then preemption needs to be disabled so that the readers don't leave forever. And the moment we disable preemption, when we talk about preempt RT, the moment we are not happy because disabling preemption means latency, right? Remember the slides I had four, four slides ago when I talked that you might have your user space application and it won't respond to an event. So in any case in the kernel, if preemption is disabled, then practically speaking, your RT application is blocked. And that's actually latency. Exactly this is what latency is about. And this is the whole purpose regarding the questions on the previous session, the whole purpose of RT. We want to make sure that we run your application as soon as it wants to run. Uh, the second problem was that since we in preempt RT want to make that path actually preemptible, then there is the risk of the read side looping forever. Because what happened is, imagine on a single CPU and the right side is working, and then within the right section, a preemption happens because your application, for example, wants to run, respond to a certain event. And your application then does an innocent system call, which goes into whatever subsystem in the kernel. And then, unluckily, unluckily for you, you, this code path hit the read path of the same uh, sequence counter that was preempted. And this means that the reader will actually loop forever and the kernel will be blocked and basically this core is now over. So that's a kernel bug and the core is dead. And what we did in RT around two years ago was that we made extra safety mechanism so that if we are in RT and we know that the preemption model is the highest preemption model, which is preempt RT, which basically the most preemptible model in the kernel, uh, then we actually do extra sanity checks to make sure that we don't loop forever. And the result of what we did two years ago was that not only we made sure that the existing drivers are still working, so, but we also enhanced the API in a way that actually made sure that there is more extra lock depth integration so that what happens is not only that we fix the problem on preempt RT without disturbing the existing drivers, but also mainline has the benefit of actually uh, extra lock depth checks. And uh, after that, there was also something called latch, latch sequence counters, which is a special variant of uh, sequence counters that were only used in very delicate code paths uh, in, uh, in the kernel. And then we also formalized that and added some extra sanity checks. And then the rest of the kernel actually began using that API after it got uh, formalized.
So this is one of the patterns. The, the second pattern was tasklets. So the kernel, or the, let's call the core kernel locking group, wanted to actually get rid of tasklets for a long time, but the number of call sites are extremely huge. And there is also uh, this problem in the uh, that was existing before is that tasklets had a certain call that's called tasklet disabled or, ta uh, or tasklet uh, kill, which means that on the, on, you can send a signal to actually say, okay, I do not want to respond to, uh, to, uh, to, I don't want to run my handler even if there is a pending signal. And like what happened with sequence counters, this also has the same busy looping problem. So imagine that you are uh, at, at the tasklet handler, and then again, because preempt RT makes all the code paths as preemptible as possible, so you get preempted, and then you go to a code path which calls tasklet disable on the same tasklet that was preempted, okay? And the problem is that implementation was actually busy looping. So again, you hit the same problem of busy looping while, uh, yeah, and then the core is basically dead forever because, okay, that's another kernel bug. And we hit this kind of looping mechanism in a lot of areas, and this is one of the most common patterns. So there was also uh, certain code paths in VFS where there was the same pattern and we also had to uh, uh, yeah, invent mechanisms to actually avoid this problem in, uh, in RT. So to do that, and this also shows you a sample of how we work actually in preempt RT. So uh, like, preemptorT looks a little bit simple from the outside, I would say, but actually we do really like hard work or extremely hard work to make the kernel work with all this preemption involved. So actually, for this, for this single problem of uh, killing a tasklet, the same tasklet that was originally preempted we actually surveyed 400 plus uh, call sites. And they are all drivers, there were 400 drivers. And we couldn't actually automate, uh, and we wanted to know, what we wanted to know is, is the, is the context of tasklet kill, tasklet disable, uh, preemptible or not? Because if it is preemptible, then we don't need to busy loop anymore. That's our problem, right? So if we don't busy loop, then actually, we, then we can solve that issue. And uh, yeah, we surveyed manually the 400 drivers across everything, networking, graphics, drivers, SCSI, and, and we discovered that actually all of them except 10 call sites uh, were, co were calling the tasklet delete or tasklet kill from preemptible context. And then what we did to avoid that problem was actually to use condition variables and normal sleeping mechanism instead of busy looping. And then this actually broke this busy loop pattern. Uh, yeah, and I want to stress that this is a big part of what we do in preemptrt. We always try to, because the moment you have a preemptible code path and then you have any sort of infinite loop, the moment you risk yeah, killing your CPU basically, and this is in se uh, sequence counters, tasklets, and various other APIs. Uh, the other call sites where uh, where they were actually co using tasklet, uh, killing tasklet from uh, atomic context, were actually buggy, and we also fixed those. So, uh, and then. Uh, all of the tasklet API is now working under the hood without anyone noticing with preempt RT as well. 
And uh, Tasklet in general, so there is a lot of ongoing work to remove Tasklets from the kernel. It's still ongoing. So, uh, yeah, there are some things that can only be done through Tasklets, and the network subsystem still uses part of these things. But we hope it can be deleted in the future. So. Who is uh, getting rid of tasklets? So there was a submission uh, on February, actually, uh, Tejun. So we no, he just relabeled it. Okay. So it's like you take an apple, you make it orange, and then you say it's not an apple anymore. But if you remove so the it's color, it's still an apple okay. underneath. Okay. 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 So. And we still also want to keep all the hooks about deleting the tasklets and disabling and all of that. Well, you could move one by one to Tejun's API, yeah. but nothing changes. You still have cave worker with disabling the work thingy. And yeah, so this doesn't change. WorkU doesn't have the problem because WorkU has a raw log for um, enabling, disabling, and scheduling for its uh, maintenance. Mm -hmm. And tasklets may have long looping parts that they don't even have locks for it. Yeah. So that's the other part. If you have long looping parts, which work you doesn't have, then you need some kind of other synchronization. Okay. And yeah, in preemptor T wise, we will still. Yeah. So this is part is done. There is no to do elements in the future. Well, we could. I mean, <clears throat> I've been looking. Networking doesn't do tasklets, by the way. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of. Uh, there are certain drivers that do work queue and tasklets yeah. and an API, and this is different. Um, SCSI has a lot of drivers that outsource to tasklets. Yeah. And. They have also this poll thingy, which is the, the an API copied by Christoph. And they, it's all the thing to deal with the problem that they get many IOs and they don't have uh, many queues. Mm. Because networking, you come and get a certain queues, like 20, one per CPU, and you don't have much of a problem because you don't monopolize the CPU then. And then people started doing tasklets and not because they thought it's nice. Mm -hmm. But you could move it to a threaded interrupt and then be done with it. But then the SCSI folks are but not so easy going in changing yeah. the core code. Yeah. Yeah, because also my understanding that they wanted also to maintain some locality on the cores and stuff like that. This depends. That's the SCSI, yeah. This is, n yeah. But you can still have, let's say, worker on the same CPUs on the same core. It's not a problem. Okay. Okay. But yeah, go on. Yeah. So. Yeah. So yeah. So that's basically regarding the tasklet part, and the most important, actually, for me regarding this talk is because people are a little bit confused about the preemptor T part, is that if you really use the standard kernel locking APIs, and if you really use them as they should be used, not, and do not depend on implementation details of such locking APIs, we do all the hard work for you. So we only hit problems when drivers are kind of overly smart doing something that they should not be doing. Uh, there were, for example, during the sequence counter work, a lot of drivers which open coded certain lockings and because they thought that their own implementation is better than the standard kernel locking mechanisms, uh, which is not true, not just only, not just only from a performance perspective, but also from a lock depth perspective, because the moment you do your own locking, then you lose all the kernel infrastructure and validation and so on. So, yeah, so this is what mostly, and then when RT also becomes mainline, this is also expected to be the goal. So the moment 
any driver to be submitted which actually breaks on RT, and most probably, if this is not an RT bug, then we hope that the driver will not be merged because it's not respecting the kernel locking APIs and so on. So there was also, and this is the same pattern of drivers being overly smart or drivers trying to yeah, do low level yeah, checks or low level implementation is checking the context. So there were some macros that were added by the locking subsystem in certain parts of the scheduler to check the context, whether it is are you in preemptible context? Are you in hard IRQ context? Are you in soft IRQ context? And, uh, and the problem with these macros was that their semantics actually was different according to the preemption model of the kernel. So whether you have like preemptRT or you have other preemption models, then the semantics was different uh, and, if, and even if you have something like config preempt count and if you have uh, a certain number that can actually, for example, preemptable might return always uh, false and then some drivers and some subsystems were actually using these macros to automate memory allocation and so on, uh, to doing the memory allocation, whether through GFP kernel or GFP atomic and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, and this also hurted us considerably during preemptority, and we did also the same thing. So, just like the Tasklet use case, where actually, if you download the slides, there is a link to a Google Sheet where I show the survey, all the surveys that we did. We also surveyed all all the call sites, and for example, in the SCSI subsystem, there was libsas and certain other components where we had to manually pass the context to the APIs and instead of making the APIs act smartly and try to find the context and adjust the memory allocation accordingly. Uh, and the benefit of that, we actually added rigorous and for each commit, we actually showed the full context analysis of all the call sites and then we had a proof that the driver or the driver subsystems don't actually need that much to do all these context checks. They, it, it's much better to actually be explicit about it, know your context and just submit it as a parameter according to the call site. Uh, and the same with USBs and so on. Probably the last thing that's actually uh, now in modification in driver's land is the print K ongoing work. So regarding atomic consoles and so on. And this is actually most of Sebastian's patch queue right now, all the console uh, locking that was added. Uh, and there were also some uh, code in graphics drivers and so on in DRM and I915 and so on, where there can be open coded, for example, disabling and enabling interrupts and instead of, for example, calling spin lock IRQ save and so on. But after actually the print K merge, the full merge with all the drivers mainline, then again, we stress that if your driver is using the kernel locking APIs as they should be and do not and, and, is, and does not depend on the implementation details of the locking APIs, but actually implement on their well spe their specification, then your driver should work out of the box. And that's actually the entire job of preemptRT. We all what we want from pre all what preemptRT wants is to utilize the existing wealth of all these drivers that has been written for 15 years for all the different architectures, and with all that, still run all the standard Linux user space and then provide hard lat latency guarantees for high priority 
real-time applications. And yeah, and that's basically it regarding drivers in pre MTRT. If there are any questions, I would be happy to answer, and I would also be happy to answer the question that was the last question in previous session about why pre MTRT is special and yeah, if Yes, sorry. All these problems with open coding. And, and, uh, I'm not sure if it's recorded, but I can hear it, so I don't. Oh, yeah. All these problems with Thank open you. coding and sequence counters yes. and uh, weird ways of re implementing context switching. Is that something that with static analysis, like maybe with Cosinel, we could? automate detection of those things? Uh, yeah. Or would that just be too hard because all the weird things that people have done are too different from one another? So, yeah, so when we actually do the surveys, we use Cochinelle at certain parts if it is simple parameter swapping or if it is really a repeated context. But all what we did in the sequence counter stuff, the information was actually all dynamic and not static. And this is why we had to go through all these hoops where we actually change the internal locking implementation. So, so when we do, for example, the survey for tasklets, we had to do the 400 drivers manually. And like I shared the sheet with Sebastian and like we divided like 200, 200, and then we had to check each one manually because we couldn't actually automate the part of knowing if the call site context is preemptible or not. So we wish it can, but we still, in, in, in a number of cases with these surveys, we cannot yet. But um, one thing I would like to add is, um, first of all, you have to see things that fall apart. Then you know what you have to looking for. So um, we have seen a case where the tasklets uh, um, locked up because of the API. And then we had a workaround for it for years. And then we tried to solve it properly. And then we had to look exactly for a task thingy. The same goes for the other parts, like in interrupt. Most of the people using it were not doing it for the reason they thought they were doing it, right? And so if you want to help the open coding at some point, um, sure you can do it, but you have to know what you're looking for. And the best way is actually to abstract it with the API so you, that the people don't try to open code it. And nowadays, if you switch the preemption model and it fails to compile, then you already are at the point that it doesn't compile anymore because of the open coding that is not, not working anymore because the members are gone, are different. And then you are at the point that the K robot may reply to your patch that this isn't compiling on RT and you're done with your extra work. But that also just, but that also assumes that the open coding depends on internal details. So, for example, the sequence counter stuff was failed during runtime, so not even during compile time. So, yeah. So. Yeah, uh, so I think my, my question is fairly generic that now that preemptRT is getting really close to being in mainline, right? What do you have to say about the other approaches with, you know, moving all the real-time stuff into another core and with Zephyr or any real-time OS, right? At which point do we decide that, you know, you know well, that doesn't need to happen because preemptRT is here? Yeah, so we have customers who actually uh, do that through certain mechanisms, for example. So through some hypervisors, like embedded hypervisors and statically partitioning the system. Here is like, I want this core to have like my Artos, free Artos or other Artos and Linux does that. And for example, the jailhouse hypervisor, you can actually do exactly that and provide all the safety mechanism. So you don't even need to do hacks, like it's well prepared for that. 
So there is a place for this, and this depends on your use case. So, and also depends on, is your real-time application like a Linux application, or is it just something small? So the whole benefit of this picture basically is that when I say the real-time applications here, these are still standard Linux applications. And we require you to do some stuff like in the, in the locking and the POSIX APIs and stuff, but it's very minimal and we have it in the RT wiki, just like five steps. So this is where it depends on your use case and your latency requirements. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just just sure. editing one on, on top of this, <clears throat> is that when you have this idea of partition in the system, there is an orthogonal feature of the Linux that helps, which is CPU isolation. Nowadays, the CPU isolation can deliver like almost fully isolated. There is a tool that is a companion of the timer lot, which is OS noise that helps to measure <clears throat> how much noise the operating system is editing to an isolated CPU, where you could confine your real-time tasks isolated. And it's in the order of 20 microseconds every second. There is even a change now that I'm doing on the kernel to help in this case with the real-time throttling, but it's uh, it's good enough for the vast majority of people. I have a very specific example. So I have a very specific common example, which is audio, right? I mean, a lot of audio needs to be on Linux, but still a lot of SOCs have their own RTOSs running yeah. on DSPs and things like but, that. But audio is actually a really good example of this of the preempt RT case, because actually, like, on, Li on the Linux RT users mailing list, we have a lot of users who submit bug reports who are professional audio people. They are not even programmers. They don't know, like, the, the Linux details. And in that case, it's actually really helpful. So I worked actually in Pulse Audio and a little bit in Pipewire, and then it's really helpful to actually have real, real-time priorities for the RT parts of these audio mixing demons. So this is actually, so this example is actually a validation of the preempt RT model, not the other way around. And, uh, and also one thing regarding the static partitioning. Uh, so when people do static partitioning, it's also, uh, and yeah, and thanks Daniel for the correction, you are correct actually. It's not only for performance, also for safety and standards compliance and stuff. So sometimes people want to have their artists like certified by certain, uh, there are multiple safety certifications and then there is a benefit, not just a performance benefit, which as Daniel said, the numbers are close, but also uh, yeah, safety verification benefits until the ELISA folks like, go on, but the ELISA is still R&D at this moment. Yeah, so. Did that answer your question? No. Yeah, so yeah. if we don't have any more questions, we can do a, a pause, have a, have a coffee, and, and return at the 11, which is the next slot, right? Okay, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.